Okay, today we're just going to talk briefly a little bit about Abraham, what we see recorded in Scripture as uh, the things of, uh, of Christianity really seem to be being made overcomplicated and understudied at the same time. So we're just going to look at uh, Abraham, for instance, is considered the father of the faith. Um, the Apostle Paul draws often from uh, the events recorded in Abraham's life. But Hebrews 11 is a chapter that records many of the, the Old Testament saints and their accomplishments that were performed through faith and the fact that they had chosen to trust God and Faith is not a complicated concept, but it seems to be being uh, made to be something difficult. And, you know, watching a recent debate, the, the, the way it played out, some of the things said was just so complicated. If, uh, if, I, if I was a young believer or even a lost person coming across this, I would definitely leave way more confused than than uh, having anything clarified in my mind. But Hebrews eleven one says, "Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it faith." The elders obtained a good report, a good record. And then it goes on to list uh, many saints within that chapter. Abraham, for instance, we see him being brought in early in the chapter, Hebrews 11, 8. Helps us fine-tune our understanding on when Abraham trusted and when he chose to trust the Lord, believe in the Lord. Genesis 15, 6 gives us a summation later of a clear statement that says that Abraham believed in the Lord and the Lord counted it. He credited it to Abraham as righteousness. It says, by faith, so the faith existed. And this is talking about what your religious people would call saving faith. Like there's a special kind of faith that has to be a different type of trust. And it's not the type of trust that's uh, a problem for anyone. It's the object. It's not whether it's a small and you are one of those that are ye of little faith or ye of great faith the more faith you have the more you will be used in, in the better life that you will have knowing that God will do what he says he's able willing and but it's not the amount of faith God has given all men Everywhere, the measure of faith. Now, billions of people misplace that faith, that trust. The Pharisees placed that trust upon themselves and that they were righteous, that their actions and deeds were sufficient to warrant a good relationship, good standing with God, and, of course, heaven would be their home because they had chose to trust themselves. They had decided within themselves to place their trust there. Me, when you look at the world's religions and how they're broke down, those within the Islamic culture have taken that measure of faith that God has gifted them, that universal characteristic within our design, 
and they place it upon Allah and his messenger, Muhammad. They have taken that faith and misplaced it. They have decided to go that route. The Mormons have decided, despite other influences, to follow the writings of, of people like Joseph Smith. Abraham hears the call of God. He hears the Lord call him. <clears throat> Abraham decides to hearken to the voice of God. He makes a decision with any and all things going on around him. The fact he lived in that area, he had family that would have to go out. All those factors, he chose to trust God <clears throat> and hearken to God's voice, to obey what God told him to do. The faith was the foundation for the action. Now, when did God call Abraham out? Where do we first get a good, clear statement for sure um, that God called Abraham out? We go back to Genesis 12, where it is said, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from their father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. I haven't shown it to you. Some would see this as what we call blind faith. He did not see the object to which he was promised. Actually, according to Hebrews 11, that's exactly the point. He's entrusting his future in something that he has not set his eyes upon. And the object is the fact that God promised him this future. So Abraham departed, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. It says, by faith when he was called to go out into a place that he should after receive blind faith, as they call it, as some people call it. That's exactly what happened. He did not see the promise when he should after re receive for an inheritance, obeyed, he hearkened. That's what obey means, that you hearken to the voice or to the commandment. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. Not knowing. Not having full understanding of every nuance and detail. Not having a postcard of, hey, this is where you're moving. And this is what I'm giving you. He did not know the actual land per se, of where he was going. But he had faith. He had entrusted his future to a promise of God. God called him out. Abraham decided to trust in that which he had not seen. And based on him placing his trust willingly upon God, without all the details, just the object being God and the fact that he said it, he went out. And that's what, what faith is. It's putting your hope, something of value into another's hands. When you go to a bank, you decide whether that bank to you is worthy of your trust whether or not they can function in all the capacity that you expect and hope that they will. Now, if your, your trust is misplaced, you can be fully persuaded. And the bank is insufficient to carry out the task. If you're deciding to repel off the side of a cliff, you can be fully persuaded by all the things you read on YouTube and all the videos that you see 
that it would be a good idea to do it with dental floss. The problem is the object is insufficient, but in your mind, you can decide, I'm confident enough that this dental floss will hold me as I repel off the side of the mountain. And you have misplaced your trust. Now, if you do it with a sufficient cable or line, you can do it with shaky hands. You can do it with rapid breath. You can sometimes have a, a big wind blow and, and move you around. But if the anchor holds and the rope is strong enough, how much you trust that rope will not determine the rope's strength and as whether or not it will save you from plummeting to your death. That's what faith is. You have entrusted something and you have took taking that leap to which you are committing yourself to that object. You are committing yourself to that bank. You are committing yourself to that cable and putting your hope in it. The amount of it or whether or not during the ride down the mountain, there's some times in which your, your trust in that rope becomes kind of uncertain due to extenuating circumstances and the things of the world blowing you around, slamming you against the rocks. It's not going to determine whether you make it to the bottom safely or not because the anchor holds, the rope holds. When you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, the anchor will hold. The rope will hold. That's just the truth of it. And the reality with these, these really bad, gnostic -y, mystic -y views is they don't prep a believer for the reality is the fact that there's times the wind will blow. The rains will come. They will beat down upon the believer. Sometimes we will get our eyes completely off the rope and we'll get spun around and we won't be looking at Jesus at all and maybe even forgetting he's there for a moment and the things of the world might become really terrifying and you might feel like you're free falling. And when we get in broken fellowship with our Lord, that's going to happen more and more. So what do you do? You turn back around and realize and you focus on what it is that has you. And that's God. That's Jesus Christ and his promises, even for the things that you can't see, the evidence of, of things that you can't hold within your hand. And we see that in the life of Abraham, because when you track all the way back to where Hebrews says that Abraham by faith, and that would be saving faith, obeyed. That's initially right when we see him introduced in the scripture all the way back in, in Genesis 12. And then look down the line at some of the things in Abraham's own life and in, in the times when he wasn't uh, rock solid and perfect. And when the events of his circumstances took his eyes off that promise when he went into Hagar and tried to do it himself and rush the process. That was a lapse of faith, a lapse of trust. He had decided to go a different route. When he lied about Sarah being his sister, he decided to do wrong. Paul camps over and over and over, and so does the Apostle James on this truth. Abraham's faith, his trust, the very trust that was upon the object, the Lord, that wasn't always perfect, but the object was perfect. That it was counted for righteousness. Abraham believed God, believed in the Lord. That was the object of his faith. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. These over-religious, over-philosophical people, 
that try to approach the Bible solely academically that have no practical life skills, it seems like, how to be able to, to take the truth out of Scripture and bring it into the this this day and age or any period of time to show the application. They're just people that are waiting to trip upon. Faith is not complicated. Those within the ark were saved. Those outside the ark, had they decided to get into that ark, they had never seen rain. They had never seen a global flood. If they had just decided to hearken to the voice of God's righteous preacher, whether they rode for a year screaming and, and bellowing as the ark got tossed around or whether they took a nap, the ark would have saved them from their peril. And when we trust Jesus Christ, it's not about the quality of our faith. It's not about the, the hardcore perseverance of every second of every day of our faith. It's the object, Jesus Christ, that we've placed our faith in that saves us. And that's a choice that all people have to make. And then after you're saved, you're going to have to continue to refocus and look to the Lord. When the circumstances of life just keep kicking your teeth in and knocking you down and scaring you and the storms and the things, cl you know, clanging and banging and the mortality of life becomes more and more evident as you get older and you see people getting sick and hurt and passing on. Those things are going to distract you. And just like Jesus, when he called Peter out onto the water and Peter took his eyes away and looked at the storm, he began to sink. And we as believers, when we take our eyes off of Christ and we forget the foundation that we're standing on, we can spiritually begin to sink. All the way five chapters later in Genesis 17, long after Genesis 15, long after Genesis 12, Abraham, when speaking of this promise, had a moment that he wasn't fully confident at this time. It says that Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, this wasn't, oh, Lord, you're so amazing. I heard the most ridiculous comment from somebody thinking they're trying to spin this um, perseverance of the saints view so deeply they can't read the text. They don't believe what the Bible says. They don't believe that by faith Abraham obeyed and left. They don't believe that. They have their own view. When the Bible clearly says it was by faith that led him to obey. Abraham, a question is not a confident statement. A question is the antithesis of confidence. And he says, shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? Question mark. And shall Sarah that is 99, 90 years old bear? Question mark. That's not full persuasion in that moment. That's not perfect faith in that moment. The next chapter, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, Am I, <clears throat> after I am waxed or grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? Verse 15, Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not. She lied. She had a, a not full confidence in that moment. And then she laughed and then she lied about laughing. Why? Because she was afraid for she was afraid. And the Lord points out, nay, but thou didst laugh. Yeah, yeah, you did. So faith is simply deciding to trust a promise, trust an object, trust a rope, trust a bank, trust a chair that you're sitting in. And you can put that faith in anything you desire. You can put it in your effort. You can get bewitched later and not think that now after you've trusted Christ and were fully persuaded that now that you and your works and your merit is what makes you whole. 
That's believers can do that. It's this whole bewitching spirit that we can fall under. Fear is a bewitching spirit. Over and over, what does God say? Fear not. Why would he keep telling you to fear not? Because you get fearful. You get confused. You listen to bad teachers. <coughs> it confuses your mind. You can't, your thoughts are no longer confident. You begin to get the thinking, well, did I do this or didn't I do that or did was I fully persuaded? Whatever nonsense that they, they bring in seeds of doubt, seeds of confusion. God is clear. If you choose to place your trust on Jesus Christ, his person, who is he? Is the Son, the Father sent the Son from heaven to be a ransom for the world, to take our place. The divine Son of God, Jesus Christ, died for the sins of the world. He was buried and he was rose again, resurrected for our justification. That's the person. That's what he did. And if you understand that you as a sinner owe God a debt, that one day will end you up in the lake of fire. That you have sinned against God, your creator. He says, if you will trust him, if you will commit and decide to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in the payment for your sins, that he will credit, just like he did to Abraham, a man with normal human traits, Sarah, a lady with normal human traits whose faith was not always flawless and perfect. He will credit that payment to your account. And even if you get turned around, even if you get to where <clears throat> you are not having a good day or you've really focused on the world or you're, you're caught up in sin and your fellowship is causing a, a barrier between you and God because you're unwilling just to turn to him and confess to him and acknowledge your sin before him. Your faith is still solid because it's a moment in time in which you placed your faith upon Jesus and you decided to do this. You, you just trust him and accept that for a gift. That you are spiritually reborn and your future is set and from that point you're predestined to be with him forever even in the storms of life even in the doubtful times of life you see the same question gets asked over and over god what do you want from me it's we read the law and we realize if we're honest, I can't do this. I've already violated hundreds of these. And the Bible tells me if I break one, it's as if I broke the whole thing. Even if I didn't murder, I broke the whole thing. If I didn't commit adultery, I broke the whole thing. I can't do it. So the question keeps getting asked, sirs, what must I do? What does what do we do? that we can do the works of God. What does God want from me? He wants you to trust him. He wants you to put your faith and reliance upon Jesus Christ. It was the Jews asked and they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God, the works from God? What is it that God wants from us? And Jesus answered and said unto, him, unto them, This, this is the work of God. This is what God wants. That ye believe on him whom he hath sent. That you believe on Jesus. That's what he wants. You can't keep the law perfectly. The law points out how imperfect you are. The law points out the need for a substitute. And after you trust Jesus, what does he want you to do? To continue to trust him. To continue to look to him for answers. 
always, to grow in that faith, to grow in the discipline of turning to him for all things. Pistuo, believe. To have faith in. To have faith in, upon, or with respect to a person or thing. That is credit. Credit. You are crediting, you are giving something to Jesus, and the only thing that you have to offer is the, what he demands from all people. Their trust. Trust him. Give him your trust. By implication, it's to entrust, just like depositing your money in the bank, just like the Apostle Paul was confident that what he had committed to God, that he had entrusted to the Lord, the Lord would perform. And that goes for when you get saved and you are reborn and you pass from death into life. And then as a believer, you continue to trust. When you don't understand everything, you trust. When you're unsure, you trust. When life turns you upside down and on your head, you trust. Why? Because you come to realize who God is. Nothing happens without God's allowance. Anything is possible with God. And he always wants what's best for those that trust him, those that have become his children. It's not complicated. It's really simple. And afterwards, when you've trusted Christ, there's a simplicity in Christ. You love God. You love others. And you just put your faith in the object that can make all things possible, and that's God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope this really makes sense to you, and I hope really as believers that we can begin to discern those that have taken a problematic approach and complicating something so easy, so beautiful. And if you learn the practicality of it that is rewarding. Read Hebrews 11 for yourself, starting all over, start to finish. By faith, by the fact that they trusted God and they chose to trust him in the circumstances they were in, look at the things that were accomplished for God. through God working through people willing to trust him. Not only for salvation, that gets us in the door, Jesus being the door. That's the access. That's how we access the grace of God is by faith. But if you want to have a life that can really be used by your father, any of us, it all comes really to that one principle. Even when I don't know where you're taking me, Lord, I trust you. Even though I've never seen the land ahead of me, I trust you. Even though I don't understand what... Most of this, I don't have full understanding, etc., etc., whatever that these people keep saying. Here's what I understand. Here's what I know. You are God. You created all things. There's nothing outside of your scope of power and authority. And if you want it to happen, it'll happen. And I trust that whatever happens is according to your will. And I want to be in that. I want to be in your will and walking with you. That's what we need to do. And all this other religious, philosophical, Gnostic, uh, Calvinistic, lordship tribe. Leave them people to their self. And you just turn to God. The same God that you trusted and he saved you is the God that will forever be there for you and with you. And he will never leave you and never forsake you. And that's what I want to remind you of this day. Keep it simple, saints. Make it clear. Make it precise. Let the philosophers do what they're going to do. And you just break it down and understand it the way that God lays it out. Trust him this day. Trust him every day. And he'll forever be with you, in you. And he wants you just to look to him for all things. So till next time, I want to say take care and God bless. And I pray that the Lord just really makes this clear to you and that it's in somehow a help and god bless you in jesus name
Take care.